This is a whole new point. Yeah, this is a whole new point. Point number two, muscle contraction. I don't even know what point one was. So we dealt with basically the anatomy of the molecular anatomy of okay, microanatomy at the molecular level. Uh, and now we're going to deal with muscle contraction. How does the muscle actually contract? We already basically know some of the things that have to happen. The muscle is not going to contract as long as tropomyosin is blocking those active sites on active. So we have to get rid of them, and that means we have to increase calcium. So the question really for muscle contraction is, how do we increase calcium to cause tropomyosin and troponin to move out of the way so that we can cause that interaction between actin and myosin we're going to detail a little bit of the physics there that happens once troponin, troponin and tropomyosin has moved out of the way. And then we have to talk about supplying energy because it's an energy demanding process. It's not free. So we have to also talk about that energy perspective. How is the energy used and where does the energy come from? So we still got a lot to do. The thing that's the most amazing to me about all of this is I'm going to start lecturing here and we're going to lecture for probably two or three hours to detail everything that's going on in the cell to make a muscle contract and we're going to be detailing basically milliseconds in time. It's going to take me three hours to get through what happens in milliseconds. Okay, so muscle contraction is going to all come down to muscle innervation, interaction with the nervous system. And the way that muscles are innervated is they're innervated in this grouping called a motor unit. Okay? A motor unit. And we're going to come back around on this, but to understand a motor unit, we first have to understand that myofibers, what's another name for a myofiber? Muscle cell is innervated by a somatic motor neuron. What is somatic motor neurons? Somatic just simply means that these are going to be out in the bottom body, so these are spinal nerves for the most part. There are some that are cranial nerves as well. But they're somatic and then they are motor because this is their whole purpose is to cause motor movement, to facilitate the muscle movement. So in your mind, you're going to see coming off of the spinal cord individual neurons, nerve cells that interact with specific cells in the muscle. <laughs> now these particular nerves, and we haven't talked any about nervous system yet, we're getting there, but the nerves of the somatic, the, or the make up and hold the somatic motor neurons, those nerves, neurons I should say, the nerve cell bodies, this is where the nucleus is, are going to be found either in the brain or in the spinal cord. The brain for our eyes and facial muscles, the muscles of facial expression and that we have up here in our head and then the eyes that help us out with ocular movement are going to be up here in the brain. Everything else is going to be a spinal nerve running down to a peripheral muscle. And so the cell body where the nerve uh, nucleus is located, we're going to find that back up here in the spinal column inside of the spinal cord. Then the axon, which is this long filament, runs the length of spinal cord down to the particular individual muscle. So the axon, <coughs> the axon travels to the muscle fiber itself. And that is really what we're referring to as a somatic motor 
fiber. The somatic, somatic motor neuron is the whole thing. The axon is the motor fiber, the somatic motor, motor fiber. So for me, I have to innervate the muscle that helps make my big toe go like that. And it's going to be one individual neuron that runs all the way down there. Okay, so one big long axon. And that's going to be a somatic motor fiber that innervates that hallucus muscle. Now this relationship or the innervation relationship the innervation relationship what we're going to find and this is this is follow along with me we're going to try to make this as clear as possible but there's some interesting intricacies going on here so so listen up we're going to have a single neuron or you could say that we would have the single somatic motor fiber or that axon that is going to branch up at the end into many terminal branches. And we're going to refer to that as the terminal arborization. So here is this terminal arborization. And you can see that there are a single axon coming down towards the muscle and then it branches off. And that single neuron, as it branches off, is going to branch off in such a way that it innervates multiple myofibers. What's another name for myofiber? So we're innervating multiple muscle cells with a single motor neuron. When I send a signal down that motor neuron, so I send down my signal, it travels down the motor neuron, and it reaches that branching point, the signal is going to distribute on all of those individual myofibers that that single motor neuron is interacting with and interleaving. In other words, all of the myofibers that are innervated by a single fiber or neuron contract together. They respond together. I forgot two or two. No, never mind. Um, what I meant to say before I said this, so I'm going to come back and we'll go through all of this again. In addition to, so a single nerve fiber innervates multiple fibers, myofibers. Each individual myofiber in the muscle is only going to receive an input or an innervation from one nerve. Okay, so a single nerve innervates multiple fibers, and that's what you're seeing here. So this green nerve fiber here comes down, and this individual fiber, it interacts with this guy here, it interacts with this one here, and then obviously some others that are embedded within the muscle. The purple, it comes down and it innervates this muscle here and this one down here, but doesn't innervate any of those that are innervated by the green fiber. Okay, so does everybody see what I'm saying? One fiber, one neuron, several or many myofibers. But only one nerve per one myofiber. The myofiber doesn't have multiple innervation points. So let me let me try to illustrate this a little bit. Okay, so let's do it this way. Just hold on, Paige. I'm going to draw in a green works well. So here's one of my fibers, and here's a second fiber. And now each of these kind of splits up into their branches. Okay. Now, um, 
you see that purple color. These are my muscle fibers here. Those are the individual cells. And so you can see that the yellow ones are going to be this guy, this guy, and this guy. The green ones are going to be this one, this one, and this one. I don't have any that would mix yellow and green together. So each individual myofiber here <laughs> each individual myofiber muscle cell has one innervation from one nerve. But each nerve is going to innervate a couple or many muscle cells. So it's still one nerve even though it's branching. It's one nerve branching off to several muscle fibers. It's only one neuron, but it branches off to several muscle fibers, and each of those muscle fibers only interacts with that individual nerve. So zen right now. <laughs> there are two neurons. I'm sorry. I really should get it. Here is B, here is A. It's showing that in any given whole muscle, my bicep, I'm going to have many neurons that innervate my whole bicep. And it's innervating small groups of muscle cells within that whole muscle. Okay, sorry. I just don't know why I was assuming that you said only one neuron. The whole muscle. That no, muscle fiber. Fibers, yeah, got it. So this this is a whole muscle. Let's okay. Gosh. I'm sorry. You're right, you're fine, you're fine. Yes, the point there the different colors are important. Okay, so this right here. Each of these, this, the circle over here, this is a myofiber. Okay, so everything that I have here, what's a good color? Red, I guess. Everything that I have here, this all wrapped up. These are individual myofibers. All of them are wrapped up. Anyone know what we would call this? It's not the plasma membrane. The, you're, you're, this is the plasma membrane. Oh, yeah. Myofiber. The myofiber? Okay. Is it an endomedium? That would be endomedium. Oh. Let, me, let me draw it even, let me give you even more detail to help kind of define some of this. Can you see the blue? Yeah. Do you want pink? <laughs> yeah. I, is that hot enough for you? Just yeah, that's the teal. Like the teal, the teal. Right up, up, up. Right there, right there. I'm going to draw in the myosin and the actin. <laughs> And that's all I'm going to draw in. But each of these would have, this is a cross-section through the muscle. So we would have more of these. We still haven't answered that question. I could draw this whole thing, and I could put another one here, and another one here, and I would be building up towards the whole muscle. That's endomesium in red. It's called a fascicle. So fascicle is bunched together myofibrils. The sarcolemma is in purple. This is myofibrils. The, the myofiber. I'm sorry, I said that wrong, didn't I? Pink is the sarcolemma. It's a muscle cell or a myofiber. In teal, those are the thick and thin filaments that make up the myofibrils. Okay, is everybody sort of with me? Yeah. yeah. So this individual fascicle, it can be innervated by, we're going to innervate it. Let's do two, two neurons here. I'll do one in yellow. So my yellow comes in, 
and it branches up and it may touch here and it may touch here and it may touch here and it may touch over here and maybe there's one over here. So now this individual neuron, it has one, two, three, four, five individual myofibers that it's inter. Now, if I send a signal down this nerve fiber, it distributes to those five individual myofibers, and those five individual myofibers will be caused to contract. So if I just did that, how big of a contraction in the whole muscle would I have? Okay. It'd be really small, because it would just be five muscle cells that were contracting. Here comes my other neuron, this would be motor neuron B, and it comes in and it innervates here, and maybe it innervates that one, and maybe it innervates that one, and so I have one, two, three that are innervated by this motor neuron. And there are two left, and maybe they're innervated by a third motor neuron that we're not going to draw. Okay? So now, this signal here comes down, and these three motor neurons are caused to, I mean, I'm sorry, those three uh, myofibers are caused to contract. And so they contract, and it's going to be an even smaller contraction because it's only three muscle cells rather than five. What if I send the signal down both of them together simultaneously? Then I get eight of them, and it's an even bigger contraction. But remember that this is only one fascicle, and I may have hundreds of fascicles in my bicep. Okay? Is this making more sense now? Yeah. Is this a lot more clear of what level of detail we're dealing with? No. Okay, so the color difference is just... Illustrative. It's saying that, yeah, it's just saying that these are two different nerves. Like, it's not the same neuron. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, color doesn't matter other than it's just saying, <laughs> this is, this purple neuron is one neuron, and you can see that it innervates here and here, and then this is on the back side, and you just can't see that. Green comes down. These guys here are cells we can't see. Here's one. Here's another one that we can see. Here's a third one that we can see, and then these two here are deep inside of the fascicle. Okay, is everybody kind of clear here? Okay, so that's the innervation. That is muscle innervation. Wait, hey, can you go oh, my God, this is I was focusing on the theory. Yeah. Okay, so myofi myofibers innervate by only one nerve. You're with me now on that. All myofibers innervated by a single fiber contract together. Does everybody know what that means? So signal comes down to those five yellow neuron, uh, uh, myofibers I just drew out. All of them will contract. The green, the three of them will contract. Together, all eight of them contract. So uh, after number three, everybody have all of this now. So after number three in your notes, what I just described to you, one neuron and all of the muscle cells that it innervates, that is called a motor unit. A motor unit. Now, I sort of actually drew this sort of accurately in my picture up here. And I didn't just like group all the yellows here, but the yellows are kind of distributed throughout there, throughout the, the fascicle and throughout the muscle. When we deal with individual motor units, the fibers, the myofibers of the muscle cells are dispersed. And this is important because what this means is that I'm not going to just have when an individual muscle cell, is, or I'm sorry, when an individual neuron sends down a signal of fire, 
if it was all within like one little tiny area, I'd get this tiny little, and I probably wouldn't feel it. But now that I've dispersed it all over, the whole muscle is actually going to have a little, but a little small contraction. But you end up being able to utilize this for muscle movement because you get the weak contraction over a wide area. Now, each individual motor unit, I can get a weak contraction over a wide area. And I might be able, with that wide area weak contraction, maybe able to curl the muscles if I call something it's real small like that. <laughs> I'm going to need several motor units. I'm going to need to coordinate the activation of several motor units for effective contraction. So several motor units needed for effective contraction. Now before we move away from the motor unit, I want to talk about the consequences of numbers of fibers in a motor unit. So number of fibers per motor unit. And as we survey all of the different skeletal muscles that we have in the human body, we basically have discovered that there are a different number of muscle cells in a motor unit. So we can have a small number of muscle cells or myofibers in a unit, and that would be a small motor unit. In a small motor unit, maybe even as low as just five individual fibers, muscle uh, muscle. Um, cells or myofibers in that motor unit. And these small motor units with five muscle fibers, these are going to be very important for fine motor control. So fine motor control, dexterity, eye movement. You better believe that for me to be able to write, which is a pretty fine motor control, I'm really only activating a small number of myofibers in small motor units. Or for me to be able to not even move my head, but I can look over there and I can see the board right now, or look over here and I can actually see page. Stop that page. That's really fine motor, unit, motor, uh, fine motor control. You watch people eat, they use fine motor control. It's important for fine motor control because you don't want to have really big, large movements when you're feeding yourself, especially with a fork. But there are going to be times where it's advantageous for large motor units, where you have to just signal one nerve fiber and you get a thousand fibers. A thousand fibers that contract. You might think about running or weightlifting, bench pressing, things like that, where we need more strength. And so we're going to use much larger motor units. Now, the average motor unit that we find in human anatomy. <coughs> The average motor unit is going to be roughly about 200 individual fibers innervated by a single motor neuron. Now, even a thousand fibers means that the biggest muscles with the largest motor units are going to have many, many motor units because we have more than a thousand fibers. We're going to have hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, millions of motor fibers. And this becomes important because one of the 
attributes that we can gain out of this sort of relationship is what's known as the multiple motor unit advantage. The multiple motor unit advantage. With the multiple, multiple motor unit advantage, we can actually coordinate the firing of some of our units And so then we can allow some units to fire and other units not to fire. Okay? Hopefully you're beginning to see whether the advantage is going to come in here. So multiple motor unit advantage, because there are multiple motor units in any given muscle, I can fire a group of motor units. So I can allow some of the unit, unit, motor units that are present, some units fire, others don't. Okay, so some motor units fire, other motor units don't. And that means if I'm running away from the bear on campus, which you're not really supposed to do that, you're supposed to try to hide, play dead, climb a tree. But let's say I'm running away and we got Andrew Neal with me and I just pushed him down. <laughs> so I've run away from the, from the bear. And it was facilitated because as I was running away, I started to fatigue some of my motor units, but I had some motor units in reserve. And so after I've fatigued some of my motor units, the others that haven't been contracting take over and begin to contract, and they take over muscle contraction for me. So this multiple motor unit advantage is going to help to reduce fatigue. So it helps to reduce fatigue. Okay, so, uh, so far we've talked about this connection between the central nervous system and the muscle itself. Now, there is a point of contact here, and that's what's been boxed in right here. And I don't know if any of you can see that, but this point of contact between a muscle cell and the neuron, it occurs uh, at the end of the neuron in what's called the axonal terminal or the synaptic bulb, and it's going to interact with the muscle cell. And there's just going to be that one point of contact between the muscle cell and that nerve fiber. And we're going to call it a neuromuscular junction. A junction or point of contact between the neuron and the muscle. Neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction. So we can actually blow up an example of a neuromuscular junction. The other thing, too, to note here is this is not, the, the general is not really specific to just muscle. We're actually going to see very similar structures and interactions neuron to neuron and neuron to other types of tissue, such as smooth muscle or digestive system, urinary system. Okay? So there are junctions in all of those other places as well. We're specifically going to start looking at the neuromuscular junction, the junction between the innervating neuron and the attached or responding muscle cell. So the neuromuscular junction is just simply going to be the point of contact or where the myofiber interacts with the nerve fiber. So point of contact. Now this point of contact looks very similar to this where we have the neuron here and then we have the sarcal lemma or the cell membrane of the muscle on the other side. This whole thing, this point of contact, 
is going to be referred to in general terms as a synapse. So the synapse is the connection from the nervous system to another tissue. If it's specifically the skeletal muscle we're talking about, the synapse can also be called a motor end plate. Now, what you can see in this figure here, you see how there's kind of an indentation? The sarcolemma is actually going to be indented to accommodate the nervous system here, the, the synaptic bulb of the neuron. So the sarcolemma is imprinted to accommodate the neuron. So we need to kind of keep the anatomy in mind here as we're talking through this. We're going to have a neuron side of the junction and we're going to have a muscle side of the junction. On the neuron side of the junction, we're going to have, so this is the nerve side. So on the nerve side or the neuron side, we're going to call this the synaptic knob. So here's our synaptic knob. And what you can see is inside of this synaptic knob, I have a bunch of vesicles. So the synaptic knob, the nerve side of the neuromuscular junction, is going to contain these vesicles. In the picture, the vesicle contains some red dots. So the vesicle's filled up with something. On that, in that synapse. They're going to be filled up with a molecule that's called acetylcholine. Okay, and I'm a lazy biologist, so I'm going to just simply abbreviate that as ACH. So the synaptic knob contains vesicles. You can call them synaptic vesicles, or you can just simply call them vesicles. And those vesicles are basically lipid bilayers, um, little tiny pieces of membrane wrapped up containing those uh, molecules called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to also be referred to as a neurotransmitter. And we actually see neurotransmitters all over. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter specific for muscle contraction, but we can look at other places and we might find an acetylcho or uh, we might find um, a neurotransmitter like dopamine or serotonin or GABA that are acting as neurotransmitters. Now the term neurotransmitter, just simply put, it's going to transmit the signal from the neuron. Okay, so that's why it's called a neurotransmitter. Does anyone, can anyone identify the biological function that's happening here? How is that neurotransmitter acetylcholine being released from the synapse? What's that? No, nope. this is, this is in, inside the body here. We're not able to see this. This is a neuron, this is a muscle. Yeah, how's it being released? Oh, exocytosis. Yep. Okay, so here's an ex example of exocytosis. So acetylcholine enters this space. This is space, and, and I don't know if you can really tell this or not, but there's, there's a gap right here between the synapse and the muscle cell. 
That gap is referred to as the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft. So acetylcholine is going to be released from the synaptic knob, the neuron, into the synaptic cleft. And it's going to be done through exocytosis. Now, without going into a whole lot of detail, and this might be close to the last thing that I'm going to talk about tonight. Yeah, probably the last thing. That relationship between the acetylcholine release and the neuron is facilitated when calcium rushes into the neuron. Calcium is also going to rush in down here, but this is going to be a separate event down here in the muscle, but it's going to be a separate event. So we're going to have to get a bunch of calcium inside of the synaptic knob in order for acetylcholine to release into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so the exocytosis is going to be simulated by calcium. Again, we have not talked about the nervous system, but you all probably should basically be pretty peripherally aware that the nervous system transmits signals. And you may even know what that signal is called. It's called an action potential. That signal comes down. They're referring it to here as a nerve impulse. That signal comes down and it enters the synaptic knob. So it's basically following the membrane down. And it's actually the, the signal is being generated by exchange of ions through the membrane. And we're going to talk more about that and how that actually happens. But in terms of electronics, or I guess in terms of electromagnetism, I should say, that nerve impulse is facilitating a change <coughs> in membrane voltage. Okay? Just like if I want to turn this light on right now, you all realize that there's a wire that comes up and it reaches the switch, and then there's a wire that leaves and goes up and then heads into this light fixture. And the reason that the light's not on right now is because I'm not allowing electricity to go through. And when I flip that switch, I've now made a connection where this lower line can just, uh, function or can um, interact with this upper line, and then I can break that connection again. This process here, I'm increasing the voltage to the light. If we had a voltage meter up here on that light bulb, we would draw 120 volts. And then when I turn it off, no movement of electrons, no voltage. Now, we're not using electrons here. We're simply using charged ions or charged particles. Sodium and potassium are going to be two of the most common ones that we use. Sodium is a positive charge. Potassium is a positive charge. If I allow a bunch of positively charged ions to enter into the cell, what's going to happen to the cell in terms of charge? A bunch of positives coming in. It's going to become more positive. That's the signal. Just like here, if I want to turn that light on, I need to increase the number of electrons that have access to those light bulbs. Electrons are flowing. Electrons are no longer flowing. So if I can allow positive ions to begin to flow into the cell, I'm generating voltage. That signal travels down along the membrane, and look what happens. I get to voltage-gated calcium channels. They're voltage-gated, which means the gate's going to open up in response to voltage. I'm creating the voltage with my nerve impulse, and it's a calcium channel, so it's going to allow calcium to rush into the cell. So when I want to move my muscle, I'm going to move my arm. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to flex my arm. Nerve impulse comes down, releases calcium into the synaptic knob, and eventually I'm going to get muscle contraction by a whole bunch of other stuff that we still need to talk about. But to get acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, that voltage comes down, opens up the voltage-gated calcium channels, calcium begins to rush into the cell. Why does it rush into the cell? It's a concentration gradient. It's much higher outside of the cell, much lower inside of the cell. Calcium begins to rush into the cell, and then by a bunch of molecular mechanisms that involve a group of proteins called the snaps and the snares. You don't really need to know that. You know, it's a cell biology type question. These vesicles are allowed to dock up 
to the face of the membrane, the neuron membrane that faces the synaptic cleft. And as they dock up, a pore forms, and they begin to open up, and that acetylcholine begins to flow out because it's down its concentration gradient into the synaptic cleft. Okay? Everything that I just told you, starting the nerve signal, sending it down, calcium rushes into the cell, causing the uh, synaptic vesicles to dock up with the membrane, releasing acetylcholine, everything I just talked to you about there, hundreds of them also. So acetylcholine begins to build up here inside of the synaptic cleft. And we will begin to talk about the consequences of that next time.